Secretary and Counterpoint, I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, Kim Snowball from Pacific Legal Foundation, attorney there and uh, Sacramento physician, Lee Welter, welcome to the show. Thank We're you. at uh, www.accesssacramento.org. Uh, on channel 17 in Sacramento on YouTube and thanks to Kim we're on Facebook so welcome to the show and <laughs> well, however you're watching tell your friends uh, Donald J Trump libertarian or opposite my confession and a proposal first I voted for Gary Johnson mm, of course and, and being so did pragmatic I. we had yeah. in California we're under the thumb of the Democrat Party mm. and doesn't matter in a sense, how we vote if we're not mm -hmm. vote, voting for the Democrats. Mm -hmm. And I voted for Gary Johnson, a very good libertarian and a good candidate. Mm -hmm. But I confess, I slept much better knowing that the uh, despicable candidate had <laughs> been defeated. <laughs> I'm sure not everybody agrees with that, but uh, mm -hmm. to learn what you need to learn. Uh, yeah, I mean, th that's a, a question. What, would Hillary have been worse? And of course, that's the question, that's the question that Democrats use against Republicans and Republicans use against Democrats ad nauseum, the, the lesser of two evils. Yes. That's, that's the argument, yeah. and in close states, uh, California is not, but in Ohio or states where the vote is closer, that's what is used to bring uh, libertarian-leaning Democrats mm -hmm. or Republicans into the polls. Yeah. That's the only thing, because yes. there's no reason to vote for either a Trump or a right. Hillary. But it's an interesting thing, I think, when you look at um, all of the pushback that Trump has gotten, and, and people seem pretty convinced, you know, because of his kind of unorthodox approach, uh, some of the things that have happened in the first year. Well, he's, you know, he's he's on his way out. You know what I mean? We can kind of uh, nominate anyone here on the on the Democratic side, and he's going to lose. But I mean, the, uh, modern political science would, would disagree, right? And and so, if I'm trying to recall stuff from college, I think that they say, well, here's how you predict whether someone will be reelected a president. Are they an inco are they an incumbent? If they're an incumbent, they have an advantage naturally yeah. because people don't want to change it up. Uh, two, how's the economy doing? If the economy is doing well, people are, are you know, usually vote with their wallets. If things are going well, they're less likely to change things up. And three, good old fashioned party ID. There are people who identify with either party and blue dog Dem or red dog, <laughs> yellow dog Democrat. <laughs> vote or, that way. Vote yeah. that way, no matter what. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, we'll see how the next three years go. But some of these early predictions, I think, might be a little unwarranted. The question about whether he's libertarian mm -hmm. or not is, is, is certainly is, not. Yeah. No. And 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 well, uh, caveat: there are a couple of places where he has been somewhat libertarian. Mm -hmm. uh, he never really campaigned particularly hard on. Uh, well, he did. I guess he said, "I'll I'll do a better job uh, uh, with the Supreme Court than Hillary mm -hmm. will." Mm -hmm. And I think Gorsuch mm -hmm. was a decent Terrific. nomination. Nomination. Right. I think uh, other nominees to the federal bench sure. uh, have been quite good. On balance, not mm -hmm. perfect, but but quite good. Would, would you agree from a legal standpoint? I think so, and I, I think it's it's important to parse out kind of will people have an idea of like you know a judge will will do X or Y, and I support X and I don't like Y, therefore I like this judge. It shouldn't be I think about endpoint whether a judge is going to kind of uh, rule the way that you would prefer. The question is, will a judge? Um, be loyal to the text of the Constitution? Mm -hmm. Are they going to sit on their hands when they're supposed to sit on their hands? Or are they going to step up and be the protectors of natural rights and, and individual rights as, as intended? So um, on the one hand, you've got Gorsuch as part of the wing of the court, I think, that is focused on the text of the Constitution. That's why I prefer that side of the court. The other side, I think, acts sometimes as kind of a super legislature, kind of imposing their politics uh, on the populace through the guise of the court, and I don't like that, and I, I don't think that people and, and should. And Gorsuch it tends to be an original, Correct. tends to be a, 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 a true uh, interpreter of the Constitution. Correct. Uh, as do some of the lower bench appointees. Correct. Okay, so that's one place where we can say, you know, reasonably good job. Another place uh, of uh, r good short-term uh, importance is the regulatory state. Mm. Uh, Scott Pruitt, as uh, head of EPA, and uh, some of the other regulatory agency appointees, I think, have been, some of them, not mm. all of them, some of them have been good. Would you agree with that? I think so, and I think so. And I think that uh, a lot of the time, especially in the modern media, people are arguing over who said what or where or who tweeted what today. And I understand that the news cycle, the way it works as a business and has to generate interest, and that kind of gets people to stay on CNN. But when you look at what's going on in the country today, the modern regulatory state is, is the, probably the most dangerous threat to liberty of, out of anything we could possibly imagine. I mean, there are so many federal agencies now, even experts don't know how many there are. They're operating you know, without democratic oversight, uh, with impunity, 
and you know, making rules that have the force of law. So I think any administration, uh, whether it be Donald Trump or, or anyone else, I'm, I'm definitely happy with any kind of rollback of the administrative state that doesn't require me going to court. You know? The problem, of course, right. is that he's doing it all through executive order. He's doing it all in a way which will be reversed day one of the next Democratic administration, which will come sooner or later. Yes, in addition, as a pragmatic businessman, he's been cozy with the Democrats mm. when it paid off for him, right. and he'll be cozy with big government Republicans if it has a payoff for him. Sure, I, I think he's a, he's a he's either you know way kind of out there or he's a political genius. I think that uh, the history books will write that story. Uh, I think it's safe to say that he's not a libertarian. <laughs> well, and, and there, where he's not a libertarian, and that is, I think, very obvious in two areas, foreign policy and uh, the drug war. Mm -hmm. He campaigned somewhat libertarian on the drug war. Mm -hmm. He said, I will, I, you know, I'm in favor, I'm all 100% I'm in favor of medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. He said, I think we should leave legal or, uh, recreational marijuana up to the states. Mm -hmm. Federal, uh, you know, federal solution. It's right. not pure libertarian uh, repeal right. of drug laws, right. but it's a step in the right direction. Better than Obama, better than any of the predecessors. Hmm. Gets elected, who does he appoint as attorney general? <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, a Nixon style drug warrior, Jeff Sessions. Right. And what does he do uh, on one of his first foreign policy uh, jaunts? He goes to Asia and plays footsie with Robert, what's his name? Uh, Rodriguez, <coughs> Rodrigo uh, Duterte, the, right. the president of the Philippines. And now John Bolton. Yes, uh, well, and the president <laughs> of the Philippines is famous for having bragged that I killed a guy when I was 16. Mm. And, you know, just over a look. Uh, bragged right. about it. Right. Later said it was a joke, but I doubt it. He unquestionably is responsible for the execution, extrajudicial execution, of hundreds, if not thousands, mm. of drug users as well as drug mm. dealers. This is a guy who is uh, an absolute menace to humanity mm -hmm. because of his drug warrior, leave no stone unturned right. attitude. Jeff Sessions probably is an admirer of that approach. Mm. I mean, that's, that's where his mindset comes from. And as soon as uh, Donald Trump said, let's execute drug dealers, mm -hmm. Jeff Sessions right on cue said, yeah, I think that's a good idea. We'll, uh, We'll, you know, we'll do everything we can to enforce the drug laws, and if that is, you know, and, if, and, and use the death penalty where appropriate. Yeah. This leads, you know, this is this is this is scary stuff. This leads to my proposal. Uh, Thomas Jefferson warned us: a poorly educated society will not remain free. And who could argue that our education system has improved mm -hmm. over the past century? Mm -hmm. Certainly has not. Uh, an educated populace will agree with, uh, with us that decent candidates will have these characteristics. They'll truly understand, protect, and defend our Declaration of Independence <coughs> and our Constitution. That's number one. Number two, serve as a fiduciary. Who mm -hmm. understands what that means? Not well, let's, let's talk about fiduciary. <laughs> uh, <laughs> who truly <coughs> understands e economics. Such a candidate would recognize that our war on drugs has been rewarding criminals and punishing their victims since 1937. They'd also see the Federal Reserve as a corrupt enterprise and would treat increasing, increasing debt and unfunded liabilities as a path to destruction. Only Krugman fans believe we can hmm. spend our way into prosperity hmm. at the same time we're hmm. borrowing way out of debt. No. Well, yeah, and speaking of borrowing, w w you know, ridiculous amounts of money, the, the, recon the budget reconciliation bill that finally passed mm -hmm. was a giveaway to the Democrats. I mean, they, they increased defense spending, increased defense spending when we're already spending more than the next nine countries combined. Right. Unnecessary, right. ridiculous on its face, but it, Republicans' uh, constituencies, military industrial complex, love that right. spending. And at the same time, that was uh, something like $80 billion in increased spending and another $64 billion in increased spending for all of the favorite social Democrat programs right. that, keep, uh, that keep Nancy Pelosi and uh, uh, Chucky Schumer happy. Mm -hmm. So the compromise was, well, we'll just increase the debt so we can both have our right. goodie bag filled up to the top. Right. That's the kind of budget that was increased, or the budget mm -hmm. proposal that was signed off on by Donald Trump after he called it ridiculous in a tweet. 
Right, I mean, right. he said this is ridiculous and signed it anyway. Well, I, wonder, I just, I just wonder. You know, I've, I've debated some people before and talked about how you would solve this kind of problem. It strikes me that elected officials are always going to be incentivized, right, under basic kind of public choice approach. They're always going to be incentivized to try to get goodies yeah. and to try to do, you know, barrel rolling for their own for their own district, sure. right. So, what is the way I wonder that we we tamp down on that? Without so tying the hands of the legislature, in case there is something that happens, and, and and you know, massive amount of money has to be spent for whatever reason, whether it be an armed conflict that we get involved in, assuming that we're not in perpetual war, <laughs> how that happens uh, through the uh, like a budget balanced budget amendment, would that be something yeah. that well, uh, you know, that's a good question, yeah. but but Trump didn't answer it. And he's <laughs> he's a, a scientist right. with the tax cut and the and the spending increases to a trillion dollars per year right. deficit, as far as the eye can see. And mm -hmm. you know, when you talk trillion here and trillion there, it doesn't sound like, you know, who understands that number? Mm -hmm. Well, it's over $3,000 for every man, woman, and child in right. the country. That's right. how much a trillion dollar deficit is. Right. That's how much is being put on every citizen's credit card, never to be paid back, right. or at least not in the, uh, the foreseeable future. Well, I, I wonder if the representatives even, if these numbers are even, if they I don't crosses think, their well, line. It's a, like, it's they like, don't, as you mentioned right. earlier, they don't read the bills. Right. So I, and, and B, I don't think they understand the economics of it. It's just, it's like, it's like getting a credit card and kind of spending money on a credit card. And, and of course, and I mean, we spent, the, the, the elephant in the room is, is the, uh, the transfer payments, the uh, mm -hmm. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all that. Mm -hmm. That's 70% of public of spending along right. with uh, interest on the debt. But another, what is it, 30% or eight, no, no, about 18% of the budget is, is, the, is the military budget. Right. And w Nine times what any other country, or what the uh, more than the nine next uh, largest spending countries, you know, China, Russia, uh, Britain, uh, Israel, the nine next highest spending countries, they don't spend as much as we do. Sure. Combined. Sure. We don't need to spend that kind of money. Right. The only reason we're spending it is because we have a proclivity to keep Lockheed and <laughs> right. Grumman sure. and Boeing all happy sure. funding. Our involvement and other right. people's civil wars, yeah, no, and I, and I think where I, we have no business. Right, right, and and you look at a person like uh, like a John Bolton, right, from kind of the old school kind of neoconservative approach John to approach to, to neopolitics, and you know that since since the end of the Cold War, you've had kind of a unipolar system, I think, as political scientists would say, saying that the United States has kind of been policing the globe, and it's just funny if you if you bring it back, compare compare the perpetual state of war now. And the spending and the, just the involvement overseas to uh, one of the debates at the, at the founding of the United States was whether or not they should have a standing army. Yeah, and, and, the, there and you the, go. the contention was why? No. Would, why would we have a standing army? We have army? two moats. One is the <laughs> Atlantic, the other is Pacific. <laughs> which is why, I, which is why it's interesting when you look at something. Not to get off topic, but the Second Amendment, the language used in the Second Amendment talks about. Uh, having maintained militias in the states with the idea being we're not going to have a standing army So if something does happen suddenly we need to call up the militia to be able to come up yeah. and, and protect uh, protect the borders And <laughs> why has Switzerland <laughs> never been invaded? Every <laughs> able-bodied citizen is required to keep <laughs> a fully automatic weapon in their oh, is home. that right? I didn't know that. Absolutely. Is that right? <laughs> Absolutely. They have never been invaded probably never will <laughs> and it's not all just the elves <laughs> well, In short, but the other the other the other problem. I mean Mike Pompeo may have been good on economic mm -hmm. issues as a mm -hmm. congressman, but when it comes to militaristic issues, this is the guy that said that the, the Guantanamo needs to stay open, mm -hmm. that NSA, the, the spying on every right. citizen by NSA is a good thing and should right. be continued. The guy that said that hero, Edward Snowden, mm -hmm. the guy that unveiled all of the, mm -hmm. uh, the illegal uh, NSA spying, that Snowden should be extradited back to the United States, given a fair trial, and then executed. Mm. Well, that assume, yeah, assuming <laughs> <laughs> kind of a, assumes what's going to happen at the end of the trial. But. He's also the guy that gave uh, executive clemency or, or executive privilege to uh, Gina Haspel mm. for her not having to testify in the trial of mm. the two people who put together uh, the uh, the uh, uh, what do you call it the uh, uh, interrogation program uh, that. Uh, Oh, oh, oh. The, uh, I, the, I forget the term, but basically torture. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Enhanced interrogation. Right, right, Enhanced right. Enhanced interrogation. She was the person who supervised that, that right. program. So what does Trump do? This is the guy that said, you know, I think we should probably, in the, during the campaign, we should uh, have a, you know, withdraw money from, from NATO if they're not contributing, withdraw our support from mm -hmm. NATO countries that aren't con contributing. We should have a, a weaker hand, you know, not not spend so much money in North Korea right. as a demilitarized zone. Well, he, first of all, he picks a fight, uh, you know, 
uh, an insult match with Kim, Kim Jong-un, right, right. which to no purpose. <laughs> right. Second, he is trying to pick fights with uh, the Mexicans by sending the military to the border now. Right. This, this is a guy who is doing everything wrong when it comes to militarizing the country. Right. Increased defense budget. Mike Pompeo was Secretary of Defense now. And Gina Haspel, the person who uh, was in charge of the enhanced inter interrogation, mm -hmm. now head of CIA. Right, right. No, Not libertarian. No, no, no. And I think, I think that you know, there's something, a, a concept they call the democratic peace that a lot of scholars talked about uh, post, post the end of the Cold War. And they went, wow, like, when you look at the world now, you know, you've got you know more democratic countries at that point, more democratic countries, nice. more yeah, free free trade. But the the thing is, that democratic peace was facilitated by policies that are run directly counter to what the president is trying to do now: yeah. Tar tariffs, tariffs, incre oh, yeah. in increased increased brinksmanship abroad. I mean, to be fair, he 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 promised to raise tariffs to get right. into trade wars. That was really that was dumb when he proposed it, and it's even stupider now. <laughs> it will do nothing but uh, probably end us, uh, you know, end up creating. I think I think it was uh, Murray Rothbard said, you know, you don't have to know a lot about economics. He goes, I know it's kind of a, a dour subject sometimes, the technical subject. He goes, but if you don't know that much about economics, then you shouldn't be going around and spouting off <laughs> <laughs> about complex issues that you don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, unfortunately, that might apply to the president of the United States. It looks like, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, and to be to be fair, mm -hmm. he does, you know, and his proclivity to overspend. Mm -hmm. He does does have experience in that area. Right. He is a, he is a, a past master at the, at the art of bankruptcy, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's where, probably where he's leading us. Uh, so I'm not sure. <laughs> to tell you that works. No, well, it's clear, regardless of how we what how we debate the details, we have a spending problem, not a revenue problem. <laughs> and there are people think otherwise, I don't understand how. Yeah, and I'm another thing about Trump, I mean, he was, you know, four square against uh, the, uh, in favor of the Second Amendment, standing mm -hmm. strong with the NRA. Right. And now after the Parkland shooting, said, well, maybe we had, you know, had, shouldn't have been gun stock uh, laws. Right, or right, right. Other, <laughs> other well, it, ma it, it makes me wonder if, if, if he won't do or say anything to to win. To, oh, to, oh to, I think to, that's to, to without question. And I think that you know, if you are someone uh, who's including, including lie to his teeth. Sure, no. The, the Amazon deal proved that. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a guy who says Amazon is using the, the the post office as an errand boy. Well, that's what they're supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> and it's costing us. It's costing taxpayers an arm and a leg. Anybody who has done any <laughs> analysis of the post office right. knows that the post office loses money on first class mail sending letters to Bozeman, Montana right. for the same price that they send them across town. It doesn't make any economic sense, never has, never will. They make money doing the last mile of Amazon package delivery. Well, and when you look you look at, you know, like the, the popularity of a service like Amazon. And he's been told yeah, that. Yeah. He's been told that but the multiple market, times. The he's market, been explained you know, to him. But the, peop, the people the economists have, have yeah. sat him down and <laughs> right. explained it to him. <laughs> right. And he's still tweeting the same old BS. But the people the people have spoken. A service like Amazon is extremely popular. And why are things <coughs> popular in a market system? Because they're offering a quality service at affordable prices that people enjoy, right? So it's it's always interesting. People will you'll have people kind of on the left talk about the government as, oh, the government's kind of benevolent or coming in and doing things for us, where, you know, the government is society. And then they look at a company like Amazon and they go, oh, that's coercive. You know, they're, they're, they're forcing people into this. We need to break them up. They're, they're far too large, you know what I mean? Well, when it's it, actually it, the it, exact opposite. Yeah, in fairness to the uh, people who, well, I'm not sure that anybody, any consumer actually <laughs> <coughs> dislikes Amazon because mm -hmm. everybody seems to buy from them. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> but Amazon, the business model never would have existed without Federal Reserve policy making it mm. possible to borrow at zero percent interest because right. they run razor thin margins, have from the beginning, mm. never have turned returned a, a you know a decent return on investment. Mm. So they're not funding their vast expansion through retained earnings. Mm -hmm. They're funding it through borrowing money at essentially zero percent. Mm. <laughs> Smart business, right? <laughs> makes uh, makes sense uh, yeah. from a business standpoint. Uh, yeah. Never would have worked without with uh, accommodated federal uh, reserve policy. My mind was wandering out to if we privatized <coughs> uh, our communication system mm -hmm. uh, to replace the United States Postal Service, what would it be like? 
Be a I think lot it would like be the, like it'd be a lot like the internet and email, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, email's <laughs> taking over first class mail. And, and, and if somebody couldn't do that, they can always go to the, the, the internet store and say, oh, scan this and send it to Casper, Wyoming. With the blockchain, anything's possible. Oh, all right, <laughs> fair enough. Okay. Um, defensive gun use, does it save lives, or, or uh, arms in the hands of civilians? Is that dangerous? in the case of mass shootings, or is it helpful? I have a simple comment or two. Uh, first of all, libertarians favor evidence and logic to counter the, what I call, the emotional commie propaganda that <laughs> favors victim disarmament, gun control. That's, that's a misleading statement. Mm -hmm. Victim disarmament is, is, mm -hmm. is the real key. And historically, every nation that has gone totalitarian dictatorship has disarmed the public before they mm. established their, their hold on power, every well, single one. You stole my thunder, 20th century. <laughs> Hitler, 21 million, yes. armed, disarmed the Jews and everybody else he yes. killed prior to sending them to the gas chambers. Yes. Stalin and Mao killed something like uh, another. Many millions. Uh, many more millions, uh, basically democide, that's governments killing their own citizens. Mm. 100 and I think it was 169 million people killed by governments, kill, governments killing their own people in the 20th century. Mostly Hitler, Stalin, and Mao, but a, a few minor players like Pol Pot and Idi Amin and Pinochet and a few others. 64 million people killed in wars during the 20th century World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, etc. How many people were actually killed by, you know, garden variety criminals, mm -hmm. crime? Neighbors shooting neighbors, mm -hmm. uh, armed burglary, armed robbery, that sort of thing. Eight and a half million. Mm -hmm. So a lot, way too many. Right. Yeah. But eight and a half million compared to 164, 169 or 64. Mm -hmm. The danger is not civilians who have arms. The danger is governments who have arms yes. and criminals. To sure. elaborate on that last uh, situation where a, an armed bystander has halted the activity of an active shooter potential mass killer, the average number of deaths is two and a half, hmm. where people wait for the police to arrive. Now, as the saying goes, when seconds count, the police are only minutes away. Right. The average or they're hiding more behind than, a car like in Parkland. Yeah, <laughs> the, the average is more than 12. Yeah. So hmm. that's uh, well, five times. I mean, I've got a whole list here. Of, oh, of, you have it. Oh, you yeah, <laughs> a whole list <laughs> no of, question. Of, of examples, which I could read, but it's kind of beside the point. What your your point is is made because whenever, whenever there are people in a school or in a movie theater or a shopping center or wherever, whenever there's an armed person there, the mass killer gets stopped really quickly. Hmm. When there isn't an armed defender around, civilian or cop or otherwise, they have a shooting gallery and yes. they make sure to use a, shoot, a shooting you know you take advantage of it, and psychotic killers go to shooting galleries. Right. They go to places where they know nobody can shoot back. Yes. That's why they pick nightclubs. That's why they mm -hmm. pick schools. That's why they pick colleges. Mm -hmm. That's the reason. Mm -hmm. And there's a really good satire. It's called Gun Free Zone. Have you seen it yet? And I have not, no. Oh, it's worth, it's worth seeing. It's, it's, it's amusing. It, I mean, I, the point. I, would, I would be suspicious of any government policy proposed that will punish um, the collective for, for the sins of the individual, right? And there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no gun Which crisis. Is exactly what's happening. There's, there's, there's no gun crisis in the United States. Gun violence in the United States is at a 30 year low. I don't think anyone wants there to be school shootings or any other, you know, mass violence like this. But when you look at something like the, the Parkland, you know, people, I, I'm all for them going out there and, and using their First Amendment rights to petition the government for changes they prefer. But I think overall, people participate in that kind of stuff because it feels good to have a cause, even if you don't know much about it, and I, even I, if you don't I, have an end goal yeah, in mind. I, I agree with your support of, of the First Amendment, but I would say, having said that, that the, 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 what we call the mainstream media has been abusing their First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. And let me give you an example of why. Two examples. One, Sutherland Springs, mm -hmm. church shooting, stopped by mm -hmm. an armed any, uh, our, uh, NRA trained uh, mm -hmm. rifleman. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was you know 27 people killed, mm -hmm. and uh, you know mass shooting, but it was stopped. 
mm -hmm. by, by, some, by, by an armed civilian. That story died within two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. 17 people killed at Parkland. That story has been going on for three months, mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. And that's a story where there was no, uh, there was no cop, there was no civilian, nobody to shoot back. Uh, and that's why they're, call, you know, they're calling for gun control in a place where there were no defensive guns used. Mm -hmm. And the, the, you know, the, the, the abuse, you know, the, the, the lionizing of the kids, the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the whole media effort mm -hmm. to say this is, the, you know, this, is the, this is what we can use to put gun control over the top. Right. That's media who has their own viewpoint. So they are propagandists for yeah. big government. There's little yeah. doubt of it, uh, since, especially since this last uh, presidential campaign season. Uh, that's, that's what they're trying to do. And that's why I'm a fan of alternative media. Well, that's, that's what I was going to ask you is, is, do you think that there should be a, a sharp line uh, drawn at modern media, like a CNN, versus journalism? In the classical sense, so my understanding of classical journalism was I th I you report you report the facts, yeah, you report I, the facts, I, and you let the public yeah. decide. Well, except that that's never been the case, even right. in the colonial or era. Well, stri even, stri in the, even in the colonial era, the, the newspapers were either right. uh, one side or the other. Mm -hmm. They were they were even probably more partisan now than, than, mm -hmm. than they are or then than they are now. But when you have a multiple sources of news, mm -hmm. what Trump correctly calls fake news, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you've got a lot of people out there on the internet. Facebook, on Twitter, on mm -hmm. uh, blogs, you know, blog posts, uh, YouTube, wherever, that are putting out news that may or may not be credible, but it's certainly at least as credible in the aggregate as what is being put out by CBS, CNN, NBC, mm -hmm. and ABC. Speaking of news, this isn't truly news, but it's wisdom and insight. Uh, Tim has been kind enough to publish these on the website pacificlegal.org. Did I get that right? You did. <laughs> and while there's still time, there are seven articles, soon to be ten. Soon there will be ten, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Number one, government is not the source of our rights. We talked <coughs> about this a little bit earlier. Number two, government power must be limited. I love it. Part three, individual rights trump government power. Sounds libertarian to me. <laughs> Number four, judges should do their jobs. Part and five. Okay, just briefly, yes. what is their job? Yeah, well, their job, the, the courts are, are designed, or at least their their constitutional mandate is to be the protector of individual rights. And, uh, not and to enforce the Constitution. And, and to enforce the Constitution yeah. to that end. And the entire purpose of the Constitution was not to empower the government, but to keep the government restrained in order to preserve the liberty of the individual. So let's see if we can get a, a surge <laughs> on, your, on your, your blogs on, on PLO. Okay. Thank you very much for being part of the show. See you again next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint, on YouTube, on Facebook, and uh, elsewhere. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Thank you.